mine. There we go. Now we're official. Yes. All right. So um, this uh, class is the second in a four part series called Creating Effective Rituals. Um, and during this class, we're going to look at personal rituals. Um, kind of we'll look at sort of different kinds of personal rituals. It will not be exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination, but just to give you some inspiration. And I think all people I see here are pretty experienced, but it's always nice to have a refresher course. Um, what to consider when you're doing personal rituals, like when, where, um, what kind of elements that you want to include that will make your ritual effective for you on a personal level. This is where you can get a little creative outside the box because it's all about you. So using something that someone else told you to that doesn't feel right is dumb. <laughs> Don't <laughs> do <story>. that. <laughs> <Interesting>. <laughs> and then um, how elements of a personal ritual kind of differ from a group ritual, because there are definitely a lot of similarities, but there are some distinctive differences between personal rituals and how you might construct them and how you might do that for, um, uh, you know, for a big public ritual. Can I get to the next slide? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is a personal ritual? So personal rituals can be used for attuning yourself to the rhythms of nature, for honoring and celebrating personal life passages, um, for personal healing and development, uh, self-care, clean, personal cleansing, meditation, deepening your personal relationship with your gods or goddesses or deities or spirits that you work with or your ancestors. Um, and those are really just only a few. I'm sure you guys could come up with a bazillion more because you know everybody's different. And I, I really highly believe that personal rituals should be so specific for you and not because someone else said whatever they said. Yeah. So um, Selena Scott, who I'm a huge fan of, I think she's a really wise woman, says that ritual practices affect personal and environmental change particularly changes in our consciousness. So 95% of personal ritual is about changing our perceptions, right? Changing our perceptions of what's going on or perceptions of a, a problem or a situation and the way we think about it. Um, and that in turn is how we experience them. So we can experience them differently. So a personal ritual can help you get over crap that's holding you back from maybe accomplishing things that you want to accomplish in your life, right? Uh, and they can be very, very, very powerful. I certainly know that as a beginner, I was pretty much a solitary and I, done, I did a lot of very past, like very passionate and very effective personal rituals that I was a newbie. So I was stumbling along. I didn't have a lot of direction and I'm still here to talk about it. <laughs> so <laughs> clearly you can make dumb mistakes or, you know, whatever. It's about really about what you into it and it's about dumb mistakes i think and i think is it, it, it's those beginning areas like when you're a beginner you're you may feel like you're stumbling but you're actually building um a house that's going to be yours you are going systematically going to trial and error as you see fit to create your own personal style that's what i would and also you'll know what not to do in the future yeah, well, we'll <laughs> <laughs> it's always wise to learn from your experiences what to do in the future and what to maybe <laughs> skip Right. Can you go to the next slide for me, please? So what kinds of personal rituals are there? I talked about them a little bit, but we'll talk about it a little bit more in depth now. Communing with the divine. So many of us have altars in our homes and there are places that we could spend some time meditating in front of and communing with the divine. These are kind of personal things that help us to grow stronger as individuals and as pagans helps us to be able to share also in the community with what we know. So we can, not just the gods and goddesses, but also ancestors. And like I practice a fairy tradition, so spirits of all sorts. I know we have some trees here that talk to tree spirits and such. So, <laughs> and a certain kind of other, I'm sure there's animal speakers here, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So um, probably the biggest reason that we do personal rituals though is for um, personal development. What I mean by that is things like doing rituals for self-love. So if we want if we want love, most of the time we should be doing rituals for self-love. Because if we love ourselves, 
we're going to attract people who love us also. We're going to be showing. If you love yourself, you're also not going to fall for the jerk because you're going to respect yourself enough yep. to not fall for the crap of somebody. We all make mistakes, and I'm not saying anyone's perfect, but certainly this is a way that we can you know, help ourselves. Healing, personal healing, whether it's physical, emotional, or spiritual. This is personal work is the most important way that we move forward and grow as people and are able to be empathic with others and be able to help the broader community. If you can't love yourself and if you can't take care of yourself, it's very difficult to have the energy to help other people. So personal rituals are very important that way. Also things like personal strength. Right? I've done so many personal strength rituals, I can't even tell you. Um, also things like um, meditating regularly or doing yoga in a very sort of ritualistic fashion. Put on music in a particular way, be in the same place, put on incense, put on candles, do the same routine even perhaps on different, you know, on, on the same days or whatever to really get that whole ritual thing going. Because once, once you've done a, the ritual the same way a bunch of times, then you're doing it without thinking about it. And you really get the huge benefits of that kind of like, that place between the worlds that you can sink into where you can slough off the shit and focus and kind of get more strength, right? Um, also things like journaling. I did a lot of journaling when I was younger. A lot of journaling and having personal doing it as a personal ritual for yourself like right before you go to bed or right as you get up in the morning or some particular time this can be a really powerful personal uh simple like right simple means you get to maybe buy a really beautiful journal and a beautiful pen and that's a part of that process also is like because when you use it it's special right and it adds power to that personal which makes you remember and makes you Maybe think when you're kind of falling off the edge, you know, you're not doing what you should be doing. You go, okay, that thing that I'm doing is I'm trying to. So your personal rituals in that way are really important. Also, gardening. Gardening is a really, really great personal ritual. I teach a weeding class, and I tell them that one of the most important things about weeding is making it personal, going out there and having me time. Take your wine, take your tea, your coffee, go out there and just relax and look at the plants, figure out the weeds, pull them out maybe. This helps with weeding. <laughs> you can also turn all those weeding put names on them. John, you are a good idea. <laughs> I like that one. Good. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> so, but there's all kinds of other things that you can also do. But those are just a few of the things that I have found personally to be very useful in my, in my career. Yes, that's that. the best one. Right? <laughs> Seriously, I get a laugh out of that one all the time. So the other really big one is a lot of folks do cleansing, especially if you're trying to heal from some trauma, some kind of personal trauma, whatever kind of level that is. Um, and there's lots of different ways you can do that. You can create a smudging ritual for yourself. Maybe you have a toxic workplace and every day when you come home, before you step into your house, you have some sage at your front door and you cleanse that shit off of you before you go into your own home to help you, you know, get rid of stuff, right? Or any other kind of situation. You know, we say when we go into space, ritual space, but if you're going to create a personal ritual, you should sage yourself at the beginning to remind yourself that you're clean, that you're, you're good, that you are, you know, you're fully present for this and you're not going to allow the crap that holds us, you know, back in our spots from, from helping you move past it. Um, taking baths um, are really important. I think I got a great picture of a bath. I've done some crazy baths, like lots of candles and incense and crystals and all kinds of stuff. But that part of it, like planning it also is part of that ritual, not just performing it. So planning those things, what you're going to include in your ritual, that makes a lot of difference. Also going to the ocean or or depending on anywhere where you live, rivers, canals, lakes, that sort of thing. Wonderful places to do personal ritual cleansings. Um, and also there's something called forest bathing. It's a Japanese, uh, there's some Japanese word for it that I can't remember, but the idea is that you ritualistically walk into the woods and you spend your time 
in a ritualistic fashion, <sighs> cleansing your aura as you're walking through, connecting with nature, <sighs> having that downtime. It's like a whole process, breathing. It's Japanese, so obviously they've got a lot of you know, specific things, but Americanize it. <laughs> mm. <laughs> we do that for everything, so we like as well, right? <laughs> Um, and another kind of personal ritual is making offerings, whether that's to the gods and goddesses you're working with, if they, if you ask them for something, you should probably give them something in return. My teacher taught me that you don't get something for nothing. There has to be some kind of energetic, it doesn't have to be monetary, but there has to be some kind of a exchange, you know? So if you ask for help, you should, if, you, if you're able, you should somehow give back. I know <laughs> this is one thing that kind of, I'm not sure about it. It makes me kind of weird out. There's some statues, like Santeria statues, specifically Yamaya, because I work with Yamaya. And there's some of these statues, either the Virgin Mary or the Yamaya statue, uh, the Brazilian one. And she has hands that you can remove. And you're supposed to take her hands and hide them. And you'll tell her, if you give me what I want, I'll give you your hands back. And I'm thinking, I would, if I was her, I would be going to fuck yourself. <laughs> Excuse my language, folks. But <laughs> that just seems kind of rude. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, that's probably a hold back to a lot so, of So, I mean, I know that there's a lot of, there's probably a lot more backstory to that, but just superficially for me, I was like, oh, that's weird. I have to look that up. We're going to see some more about that. Yeah. It's also a common practice with Santa Forte, too. Yeah, there's, I think there's a couple of different, and I don't, I don't, I, I genuinely don't understand exactly, it's, even when I read up on it, did some research, I was still like, hmm. They do that for Kwan Yin, too, they, can look, they take the hands off, like, I know, you know they, it's insane, like, why would you do that? I like, fire like, that one. I, that's just what? a person, that's a personal thing, I just feel like, if I'm asking for something, if being a jerk doesn't seem like I wouldn't <laughs> want to give you something if you were being a jerk to me. So I try not to be a jerk for the gods. <laughs> so That's making good. offerings, and of course, I also well, know they can be pretty rough when you want something. We're What's not paying that? attention. What's that? The gods. Yeah. When they want something and we're not paying attention. Yeah. You just, well, I generally call it two by four to the head. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> sooner or later, they're going to be like, yeah. So maybe that's a basis. I mean, do you that's how they like it? to be treated. <laughs> no, I mean, sometimes, sometimes they're just like, oh, you didn't listen to me. Now you're going to listen. I find so, that, that, not to go I, I know it's a little that, sidebar. I apologize. No, no, it's no, okay. no, 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 it's like, okay. It kind of <laughs> makes sense a little bit. So, no, you know, not to throw shade on anyone that's, else. It just no, no, makes no, sense I, I, that's kind of what I'm thinking back on because I think it depends on the god or goddess, depending on how they you develop that relationship, come to get to know them. Some god and goddess, that's what they'll do to get your attention. Other ones will do more subtle kind of ways. I think you're absolutely right. It's But if you take true. their hands, they can't pick up the two by four. They're well, God. <laughs> they can use the two by four with their mind. the subtle signs. They have options. So now have you have to pay attention. I, I doubt any God or gods will really be hampered by not having hands. That's what makes I them know. divine. But I think the concept is, is that just, even just the fact that you're psychologically thinking that it's okay to take something from somebody and demand that they give you something, even though you're not, you're not asking them, you're telling them, if you don't give me this thing, yeah. I'm not going to give you your okay. stuff back. Yeah. Oh yeah, I probably wouldn't do it Which myself. Is but it's a jerky thing to do. I wouldn't do it to anybody human. I wouldn't do it to anybody at No, but the fae do it. The fae take things. And they don't want to give it back unless you give them something. I don't have a horse in that Does that make it okay? Well, I just, I don't know. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They're not being serious. Do for yourself. They're just messing up. Oh, I don't know. But let's go on. Anyway, because this is a rabbit hole. The idea, though, is I think you should give offerings if you want something. It's just my personal opinion, but it seems like a good one. But you see, I would treat the shade like that. Not, 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 uh, oh, just very specific. Can you go to the next slide? There we go. Yeah. Okay. So, how and when should we do personal rituals? Um, just like with any ritual, with probably the most important thing is what your purpose is and what the circumstances are, right? So, especially when it comes to personal rituals, this kind of gets magnified, right? Because it's all about you yourself and you. It's all you, you, you. So there's no one else to really contemplate or think about. You really should be thinking about 
you know, all the details until you get it right. And then there's, there's a lot to be said for what Kip would have called, um, uh, what do you call it, lock and load rituals are the personal ones. <laughs> but as I say, with anything, um, probably the most important thing is the research, the planning, being focused with your intention. Um, when it's personal, because it's so focused, if you mess it up, I mean, within reason, you know, or you don't plan it, or you don't, if you're not prepared, and you're not going to get as much out of it. It may, it may not like smack you on the back of the head with a two by four, but <laughs> whatever you're trying to achieve may not come to fruition. So then I would think that we're going to get it immediately to bring us a gratification to people, but then time forgot to bring it up. Well, it's like it's like trying to push a car up a hill versus down a hill. Yeah, exactly. You might still get the car up the hill, but it's a whole lot harder than if you're pushing it down the hill. So the other things that I, I feel like are very important considerations are timing type things. So what I'm talking about are when you look at the bigger picture seasonal, but seasonal things can be brought down to the personal level also, right? Maybe like I'm born in the fall, so for me, Maybon is my most important ritual. It really means it's much more personal to me than say Beltane, which I like it, I enjoy it. It's a type for community, but I'm not connecting it on it on the level that I am because I'm a fall baby. Creating create your own day of power. Yeah. The other things you should think about in, in terms of timing are things like the hour of the day, the day itself, the month, the year. Mm -hmm. What are the um, where, where's the moon? You know, mm -hmm. Where's the sun? Where are all the other planets? At? Especially if you're into numerology and astrology, these are things that are very important, and they can just amp up your your, your ritual that much more. Also, personal timing, but things like personal um, birthdays, anniversaries, and important life life passages that are personal things. I mean, we do also obviously celebrate life passages with the broader community. We get married, you know, all those kinds of things. That baby type, but you can also do personal rituals around that, especially your birthday. I think personally that like an annual birthday ritual, like maybe to set your intention for the year, can be a really powerful thing. You know, That's so good. it's something that you're not probably not going to share with anybody. It's just something that you make up for yourself and that is that that close to you and that personal. Yeah, sometimes the God knows you work with have a specific feast day or a holiday that is widely celebrated in that path, and you connect and it's okay. That would be. Yeah. And also, I would consider things like, especially if you're doing something like making offerings or trying to work deeply, work deeply with the god or goddess that you connect with, is know what the feast days are for your for your gods and goddesses. Um, like I said earlier, I work with Yamaya, so summer solstice every year, I am at the beach at sunrise to do a very personal ritual with her for myself. Um, all right, next one, please. So where to do your, your rituals. Um, I think pro the most important thing regarding uh, personal rituals is knowing that you are going to have the privacy um, and the time to do your ritual without being interrupted by other people. Because that can break the energy of a ritual faster <laughs> than anything else as if, you know, I don't Especially know, if you've got kids, right. I know it's very hard. Whether it's privacy it. or silence yeah. or anything. So you might want to go to the park for your private ritual. Oh, okay. your husband, be me for a weekend. Tell your husband <laughs> to take the kids <laughs> to the park there and you go. get your ritual at home or that. Yeah. Like, oh, whatever excuses you want to come up with. Is all okay. I know for a lot of OTO um, um, we'll tell classes, they will lock the door. <laughs> you get a lot of the OTO classes. When you go there, they'll say, oh, you can come if you want to. But at a certain time, if you go like a minute, Past the time they said they're locking the door that you can't get in. Mm -hmm. yeah. But anyway, when it comes to so personal stuff, you're gonna probably get home. And your yeah. family may or not may or may not practice, or your roommates or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, or even if they do, like if you maybe like you got kids, or you have roommates that maybe are noisy, or maybe your partner is not like they maybe don't mean anything, but maybe they're loud and. Whatever. They're too curious. So, what do you do? Yeah. Are you done yet? <laughs> yeah. Can I walk? So, yeah. <laughs> I want no, to I mean, know either way. Yeah. Or so, you have a cat who's like. That's just something that I personally have always, you know, found like 
if you're doing something personal, it's really about you. You don't really want to show off to the rest of the world. And, you know, so having, you know, being able to schedule it so you can have your privacy is great. But you can certainly do them inside or outside in a public place or a private place. I've done plenty of rituals in public parks and things like that. Some of the places you can go deeply enough into the woods and people won't really see you or anything like that. So you can certainly do stuff out in the woods. Get naked in the woods a few times. Georgia mountains. <laughs> I, I was. The oh, there, no, <laughs> there's a park that I used to be able to go to when I was skinny enough to fit underneath the fence. There was a fenced off area by a canal that was blocked off. And I used to be skinny enough to slide under the fence and like do my ritual on the other side of the fence. It was very private. So there's plenty of places that, you know, <laughs> or you can, if you have private properties, they're just, you know, whatever. Mm. So, um the other thing i I, ha I recommend is maybe having a spot in your home that you can dedicate to your spiritual path or to your own um you know practices that you can turn into a spot that can be a spot for personal rituals i have a spot where i can roll out my yoga mat or i can take a chair and sit next to it i Granted, I have about 25 altars in my house, but <laughs> as you know, right? is that as many? More. I think there's 26 actually. Oh. <laughs> but I mean, I can sit in front of some of them. You know, they're like, but you could make a space that's just for you, like maybe a corner of your bedroom or, you know, like something like that that you can dedicate or maybe a shelf or something like that. Um, and the, the nice thing about having a spot that you can ritual with all the time is all your energy gets kind of like stored at that spot. So oh, yeah. like every time you go mm -hmm. in there, your energy is going to be like wall, wall. So you can really, it won't take you as much to take your energy out because as soon as you walk into that space, your body remembers, right? Oh, yeah, that, that's that energy cool. memory so that your body goes, oh, okay, I know energy what we're supposed to be doing mm -hmm. here, right? Yeah. And it doesn't, it's not going to ask you. Um, and Anyway, so basically just be able to dedicate your space. Um, can you go to the next one? That's my, oh, that's my bathtub picture. Isn't it pretty? I found it's it online. Is this your bathtub? No, no, I wish it was. I don't even no. have a It's just a pretty one, but it gives, <laughs> gives you the idea of like that whole like, they have different dimensions. Well, yeah, there. one of the rooms. I don't remember. So, because it gets. <laughs> so, what, what are the elements of ritual? Um, the same as with public rituals or with bigger rituals, right? But there are some like tweaks that you make. Obviously, not you don't have four people calling the quarters and stuff that you call them comedian. But um, like I said earlier, the most important part of this is your intent and your purpose. Like if you if that's askew, then none of the rest of the elements are gonna be useful. It's just gonna be scattered the energy isn't gonna flow right. Um, and, but this is especially relevant for personal rituals because there's nobody else there to absorb, you know, the mistakes or whatever. It's all, you know, comes back to just you, yourself and you, right? Um, and of course, especially if you're trying to affect really personal change, that's gonna, if you're scattered, then you're not gonna be able to, like if you're too shy, you want to form forthright, if you're, not focused on your intent, then probably not going to achieve. Yeah. Um, the other nice thing about personal ritual, though, is you can also be less rigid about what you do because there's nobody there to tell you that you did it wrong. So it's all about what you need and want. <laughs> Unless you have like, wrong you know, angel worry. devil here and you're talking to yourself, and I can't help you then. Sorry. <laughs> it's only wrong if it doesn't work. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, before you hurt somebody, you hurt yourself. <laughs> yeah, Maybe don't poke your eye out with your, you with your <laughs> just don't poke your eye out with your knife. Your BB gun. <laughs> or your BB gun. <laughs> or the icicle. <laughs> so like with personal rituals, especially if you do something that you know you're gonna be consistently doing for the rest of your life, it's really nice to do the same thing over and over again. It really does, at least for me, like I much more quickly get into that that place, that zone, whatever, whatever you want to call it. If I've done the same thing over and over, you remember it's it. It's like muscle memory. 
yeah, it's muscle memory. Just like when we do our opening ceremony and our closing, like we all go into a certain place, right? We, we're present, we understand, we, we have that feeling. And as soon as somebody lights a candle or says, here, we're gonna, we're gonna start, and everybody goes, okay, that's where we're, that way the group can, the group it's knows what to expect after that too, right? Yeah, we know memory. what's going focus, on, yeah. we know what's gonna happen. We can, you're, you just sort of unconsciously set it triggers it actually, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and then, of course, setting the mood, which I'm going to talk to or talk to a little bit more thoroughly in the next slide. Um, really engaging all of your senses, which I'll talk to a little bit more in the next slide, um, is also very important for personal rituals. It's important for all rituals, but setting the mood when it's personal can make or break the ritual. Let me go to the next slide. All right, so setting the mood. There's all kinds of tools you can use. Music, incense, all altars or visual props to make, you know, when you look at certain things, it automatically makes you feel a certain way, right? So putting all those kinds of things. Uh, mood lighting, altars, fires, um, twinkle lights, lowering the light so that it's dimmer, you know, like so you can really appreciate that. Other picture. sort of like mood lighting that you've got going on, flowers, statues, ritual candles, things that are also relevant to what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. like you don't want to put, you know, a statue of Thor on an altar where you're trying to do some healing work. It probably is not going to work out like you think. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> Thor is quite the healer. <laughs> if, you're, if your arm is hurting you, he'll just take the whole arm off. Sure, we'll go with that. Why not? Yeah, what you wear. Yes. Like what we wear in pu public rituals or group rituals, what you wear in your personal rituals can also be very or don't wear. That was going to say. Can be mm -hmm. also very important and mm -hmm. it can help set the mood. You know, like basically you want to engage your sight, you want to engage your touch, your taste, your smell. Your sixth sense, you know, that spiritual sense that tells you what, I mean, especially when you do a personal ritual, you want to have all six of your senses like engaged with what you're going on, what, what you're doing. Um, having a meditation area, definitely doing walking and dancing during the actual personal, like I dance around usually when I'm doing, if I'm not doing yoga or meditation, then I'm going to be dancing around my house or my room where I do my stuff. I also live alone, so I can't do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, create a focal point that you can take with you. So uh, if you have an altar, put a crystal that you can put in your pocket or put in a pouch that you can carry with you to remind you. Especially if you're trying to make changes that are that revolve around making community habits that you have. Sometimes it's really useful to have something that you can focus on, you're putting the energy of that on, then you can take it with you when that ritual is over and bring it with you. It can be anything, anything that can, that you want, that can fit in your pocket. <laughs> um, and I like it to be on me, like my purse, not like in my purse, but in my pocket, so it's against my actual, well, a couple layers of fabric is what I'm saying, like it's on my actual body, or something I can wear around my neck, so you can put jewelry, anything that's meaningful that you can wear on you to remind you of what you're personally what you're trying to do once again content i guess i've said that three times but it's three times the charm right whatever is in your in your ritual that it, it matches your purpose like once again that whole concept of having four if you don't really want your arm ripped off <laughs> <laughs> so do the research read you know what i mean but definitely at the end of the day sometimes we feel like um, we did the research and we still have another feeling about whatever work, whatever goddess or thing we're trying to do. And that's okay because you already did the research and you know why you're, you're not just blindly doing something. You're allowed to disagree with something, but do the research. I, this is my thing. I want to learn all the rules so I know how to break them better. Because <laughs> if I know how they, what are their weaknesses and what are their strengths, I can... I'm a fairy yeah. that says you have the right to your opinions, you don't have the right to facts, though. You can have as many opinions yes, as you want. Exactly. But if there's facts, like, what you argue for that for? There's, there's a difference for sure. But like I said, because what we're doing is not necessarily like a physical, like, yes, if you if I tip this cup over, the coffee's going to flow out of it. Um, 
when we're talking about more spiritual opinion type things. Everything that we do, no matter what path we follow, some human being made them. Whether they're inspired or not is not really relevant. They're still the human being that made them. And why is my path any less valid than anyone else's? Mm -hmm. Having said that, I respect other people's paths. I do not just go around willy-nilly being disrespectful, stealing things from them. Or, like if I think something is interesting because I do practice an eclectic path, I research it before I put it in my ritual or whatever because I feel like that's wrong. I wouldn't want somebody to do that to me from that perspective alone. I wouldn't want somebody to do that well, to me. that. The energy is going to be screwed because it's attuned to that person. So it's like, why even do that? Or that group of people. I'm talking yeah. about like people who are not Native American, perhaps still on Native American stuff or African or whatever tradition. I mean, you could really put that on the Asian traditions too. They don't care if you're Buddhist or a Hindu, but <laughs> other people do care more. Buddhists are like the Buddhists, we're happy to kill Buddhists, right? They're not going to matter. Yeah, be you, no be. Who we're cares? taking Buddha, right? <laughs> but, you know, Native Americans is a much more private, personal, closed thing. If you're Centuria or Kedoble or whatever path, whatever you do, I know that some of the Celtic paths also can be very close, you know, be respectful. That's all I say, be respectful. Um, so your best tools are you. Everybody at the Witch Nation should know that, right? Mm -hmm. Your mm -hmm. most important tool is you. Mind, body, heart, soul, everything that makes up you. Um, so another great one is just talking about mood setting. So a moody setting for your ritual. That's a great ritual tool. An altar that has visual cues that are relevant for whatever you're trying to achieve. Whatever that happens to be. Uh, crystals, a journal, divination tools, candles, uh, bath salts, oils or whatever that is for the kind of bath, smudging materials, uh, incense, offerings, a uh, bell or a drum. Bell or a drum can be the starting and ending of things. For other public rituals, you can do that same with your private ones. What you wear, and also your jewelry. Um, music. Music is a wonderful mood setter. I love it. I, I love music. So for me, music is like an immediate setter of mood. Um, and then also. Um, if you're not doing a lock and load or if you're not doing a ritual you're comfortable with, having an outline or a script for your ritual can keep you focused and on where you're going. It doesn't have to be a full on ritual, it can just be an outline of like how you're going to proceed so you don't forget us, like maybe figure out something really cool and then you know, you forgot it because you can write it down. <laughs> <laughs> so doing that is that can be a very useful ritual tool to keep you keep you focused and where you're trying to go. Um, so really, that's it. Those reference materials. There's a handout that I can. Oh. Whoever wants this one, I can. I'll I'll put it up on the Grove. <laughs> I gave it to her, so she'll. I'll put it on the Grove, well. and I'll try and get it on events at the Grove, so it's public too, if that's okay. Absolutely. Because yeah. not everyone, I think, is on the Grove Facebook page. So. Does anybody have questions or comments? <clears throat> yeah. Um,